Good afternoon to all of you. Are you feeling sleepy or do you want to eat some more? On behalf of Ayas Asian Theological Society, I welcome you all who come from different parts of Asia and other continents of the world, as well as from various schools, universities, seminaries, and fields of ministerial work, joining together to participate and witness the sixth annual theological forum of AATS. For without you, this theological forum would be meaningless. Because you are here, our forum is meaningful. As we resume the forum this afternoon, I'm inviting everyone to stand as we pray. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, the author of truth, wisdom, and understanding, we are grateful for having this Asian Theological Forum. Grant us with wisdom and understanding. Fill us once again with the Holy Spirit to mold us into Christ-like character as we listen and interact with various presentations on pluralism. Bless all presenters and participants throughout this afternoon sessions with peace, orderliness, and safety. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. This afternoon presentation deals with the topic monotheistic faith in a pluralistic world in the post-exilic Persian period. The presenter is an ordained minister, Bible instructor at Adventist University of the Philippines, and PhD student at IS Theological Seminary majoring Old Testament Biblical Studies. Let us welcome and give time to our hospitable, dynamic, innovative, and resourceful current president of IS Asian Theological Society, Pastor Ron Hinebago from the Philippines, to present his paper. I cannot hold my smile while he is introducing me. Huh? Thank you, Pastor Glenn. Pastor Glenn and I were uh, students of Dr. Manius before. Where is Dr. Manius? Yeah, he was my professor before. Uh, yeah, they, he was our professor before. Um, thank you very much for coming for the uh, uh, Union Theological Seminary and also from uh, Mount uh, Manila Adventist College. Uh, to uh, Dr. Lioma and also to, from uh, my colleagues in uh, AUP, in the College of Theology, uh, headed by Dr. Uh, um, Amurao, Dr. Julio Amurao. <laughs> no, uh, Dr. Amurao and also my colleagues and also from CLC and everywhere. Thank you very much for uh, coming. Uh, also, uh, from the 1000 Missionary Movement, uh, Pastor Asupardo. Uh, their CDs are available okay, outside, so if you want to avail the CDs, they, uh, you can buy later. Um, probably have noticed that um, the presentation starting uh, from Watson, the, uh, Pastor Watson, uh, we are dealing with biblical studies. After me, it will be in the New Testament. Um, area. So mine is more of uh, historical studies and it is entitled Monotheistic Faith in a Pluralistic World in the Post-Exilic Persian Period. Um, the Persian Empire which covers all of Mesopotamia and the area across the river has been a focus of studies not only in Israel but also in various parts of the world among historians archaeologists, and theologians. To the Seventh-day Adventists, Medo-Persia is a household name due to its inclusion in the prophecy recorded in Daniel 2, 7, 8, and 11. However, unlike the other powerful and well-known empires of Assyria, Egypt, and Babylon, the Bible is almost silent for the Persian. Uh, this is according to Stern. Eprin uh, Stern enumerated the books that fall on the Persian period, namely Isaiah 40 onwards, 
Hagai, Zechariah 1.8, Malachi, Ezra, Nehemiah, and several chapters of Chronicles and the book of Esther. This period must have been important and must have influenced the Bible books mentioned above. So all the several studies such as that of uh, these following names, I'll not read them all, um, they have done research on uh, the Persian period. However, there are a few uh, pages allotted to the religious life of the Persian and its uh, captives. So what is the religious life of Persia? How does Persia affect the religious life of its captives? To what extent does Persian Empire influence the understanding of the scripture, scriptures in this area? So this is the purpose of research. Um, the study seeks to find out the religious life of the Persian and of its captives during the post-exilic Persian period and to determine the impact of Persian religion, empire, to its captives and to the scriptures. Let me share uh, a short story of um, Persian empire. It was established in 550, 550 BCE. Among the great rulers who helped establish this empire were um, Cyrus the Great, Cambyses, and Darius. And in 480 BCE, this empire expanded its territory to Europe under Darius and under his son, Xerxes. Xerxes is the uh, Ahasuerus of uh, the book of Esther. The empire's territories remained unchanged not until the rising ruler of the, uh, in the person of Alexander the Great. Egypt has won its independence during the reigns of Cambyses and of Artaxerxes. However, this was concluded by Alexander the Great. Alexander of Macedonia took over as ruler of the empire against Darius III in 334 to 323 BCE. Sorry for history uh, during this uh, Holy R of uh, you know uh, when I was teaching I I don't like to teach during this one o'clock uh, period. So soon after his death, the empire was divided into four competing hostile kingdoms. I will not uh, uh, detail this because you uh, probably have uh, uh, encountered this before already. Already. So the religious life of Persia, the union and collaboration of the great king and the gods was foundational to Achaemenid, uh, Achaemenid monarchy. So the union of king and also of gods. So uh, the king represents the god uh, or the gods of uh, their empire. Mar Marduk uh, with a snake dragon. So you can see here uh, Marduk with the snake dragon. In fact, it was one of the most powerful ideological foundations. Cyrus, as recorded in the Cyrus Cylinder, reigned in Babylon as the result of Marduk's uh, guidance. So they are uh, um, saying that it was Marduk who made Cyrus uh, king or emperor during that time. In the case of Darius, the great king had been the true representative of on earth of Ahura Mazda. So look at the picture. Darius credited his god, Ahura Mazda, for giving him the throne and for the victories against his enemies. This same is true for Xerxes. He honored Ahura Mazda, which means the wise lord. Uh, taking from Ahura, or lord, and Mazda, which is wise, for reigning Persia and for giving him lands to rule upon. Although the king did not consider himself a god, he was not also a mere man. He was above men. He acts like an inter intercessor between the world below and the divine world. Ahura Mazda was considered as the greatest of the gods who created heaven and earth and men, who created Darius to be king and bestowed on Darius royalty over this vast land. He was also considered as the, the official head of the Persian national pantheon since the days of Ariya Ramnes. So in here we have a picture of godly king. 
who intercedes and rules his people under the guidance of a powerful God, Ahura Mazda. Herodotus added that the actual worshiper, worshiper is not permitted to pray for any personal or private blessings, but, but only for the king and for the general good of the community of which he himself is a part. And as part of paying homage to gods, both Cyrus and Darius offered sacrifices to them, to Aharomazda and other gods. Inside the kingdom documented by Persepolis tablets, uh, tablets E and KL, there was diversity of sex in Persia. Other gods being worshipped were Survan, Bisai uh, Baga, a collective divine entity honored in a uh, non-specific way, Midsdusi, and other gods. Okay. So, uh, A.T. Olmsted cons uh, concedes that Persia had inhabitants who were gross polytheists. So we have this uh, polytheist kingdom. Xenophon related that when Cyrus had battles to fight, he had to consult his, his gods first. Now, as soon as Cyrus was chosen, his first act was to consult the gods. Well, this is the reason why, you know, Cyrus is really pictured in the Bible as, you know, God-chosen uh, king. And even uh, the king himself is a godly person. And this is also probably the reason why uh, he was uh, allowing people to go back to their country to build their, uh, their own uh, sanctuaries. Persepolis tablets also documented the sacrifices delivered to attendants of several sanctuaries in locality, which includes grain or sheep for the gods. So he is also providing sheep so that those worshippers can worship their gods. Cyrus also offered animal sacrifices to his god. For instance, he sacrificed horses to the sun and bulls to Zeus. Priests also offered sheep in honor of Elamite gods. The sheep was in demand in, uh, in the Achaemenid kingdom, both for the palace, for king's meal, and for the temple, uh, uh, for the regular service sacrifice of Lady Uruk and all the gods of Enna. So this is the situation. Probably you can, you can uh, imagine why during the time of Malachi, they are, God is saying, uh, you are, uh, if you give a lame sheep or yeah, sheep to your governor, would he accept it? Because during that time, the emperor needs more sheep. So this gives us the context why during that time, God is, has a, you know, has a uh, competing um, enemies or competing uh, gods on earth because they want to, to uh, worship their gods and bring, uh, like for example, Lady Uruk and uh, all the gods of Iena. This may give additional information to deal with the text found in Malachi 1.8 concerning God asking the priest if their governor would accept animal offerings that are blind, lame, and sick. And our Michael Fox strongly agrees with this. There was an extraordinary Achaemenian temple excavated from 1962 to 1965 by the Italian archaeologist Umberto um, in the province of uh, Dragia, Gia, uh, Drangiana in Ester, uh, eastern I Iran near its borders with Afghanistan and Pakistan. Uh, Yamauchi further describes he found a square building that was equipped with ovens and in its second phase with three central altars. There was an immense quantity of ash and crushed bones providing evidence of animal sacrifices. Uh, Secreto believes that altars were dedicated to the triad gods, Ahura Mazda, Mitra, and Anahinita. So during that time, uh, they were offering also uh, ships to their gods. So it is helpful to summarize the gods that Persian emperors worship. Cyrus worship uh, uh, Divas, not uh, Ahuromazda. He also recognized non-Persian deities such as Marduk and Yahweh. So Cyrus recognized uh, Marduk. He also recognized Yahweh. 
Decorated elements in his palace suggest that he tolerates other religions. Cambyses paid honor to the Apis, the incarnation god uh, Pita, and also to the god uh, Saiz. Darius worshipped Ahura Mazda. Others suggest that he was a Zor uh, Zorowa Zoroastrian. Circes, unlike Cyrus, condemned uh, Dibas or Dibas. He honored Ahura Mazda like Darius. So, during that time, they were living in a pluralistic world. Oh, I'm referring to the Judahites. So you have here Judah, the religious life of the Caps. At least we have an overview of the Persian religious life. Now, although the Persian uh, em uh, emperors had been worshipping gods, which majority of them as cited above worshipped Ahura Mazda, the captives, which includes Judah, Samaria, and Edome uh, Edomea, have practiced their own religion. So although they were worshipping other gods, these people can worship their own gods. So uh, the Persian power and policy brought huge benefits to Judah politically and religiously. Cyrus, king of Ancient, permitted the captives of Babylon to return and rebuild their homelands and also allowed them to practice their religious beliefs. Even the Babylonians themselves benefit from this Persian policy. Cyrus sought Babylonian safety, soothed the weariness of the Babylonians and freed them, returned peoples to their settlements and their gods to their sanctuary. Uh, and here we can see that during the Persian period, the Judahites and the Jews were able to practice their religion. John Kessler further supported this. He declares that the Persian period is considered to be a crucial moment in the development of uh, the literature of the Hebrew Bible in the shape of institutions and practices of Yahwistic worship, both within and beyond the Persian province of Yehud. So you have these coins uh, found uh, during um, their time. And uh, during the 5th to 4th centuries, stamp impressions, some Ostraka, the ele uh, Elephantine um, documents, and eventually coins give a list of priests and governors of Yehud province and their approximate order. Also, uh, the other, uh, like the uh, Samaritan, was able also to uh, practice their own religion during this time. Stern shows that during this uh, period, both Judah and Samaria worshipped other gods. Uh, uh, please uh, take note of this. Stern shows that during this period, both Judah and Samaria worshipped other gods than Yahweh, meaning previous to. Uh, Persian period. Nevertheless, during the Persian period, in the areas inhabited by Jews, not a single figurine or sanctuary has been found. So during Persian period, uh, they were really monotheistic. They were not worshipping other gods. This in spite of the many excavations and surveys that have been conducted and the same is true to Samaria. He claims that both in Judah and Samaria during the Persian period, they worship Yahweh on their temples, temple in Jerusalem and temple in Gerizim, respectively. Both these temples at Jerusalem and at Mount, Mount uh, Gerizim revealed that they were built for the house of Yahweh. So in short, during the time, although they were pluralistic uh, uh, kingdom, they allowed their, uh, uh, their, their people or their captives to practice their own religion. So, Persian period influence upon the scripture. It's interesting, you know. If we want to understand better uh, Malachi, Zechariah, and other post-exilic uh, books of the Old Testament, we need to, uh, for the theologians, we need to study the Persian history. It will really help you. In this section, the Persian period extent of influence will be explored. Uh, this chapter will start uh, with the building of the temple in Judah. Then it will take uh, Ezra and Malachi as representative of the Persian period scriptures. The temple of Yahweh in Jerusalem should have been built. Uh, should not have been built if God did not cause the spirit of Cyrus to be stirred up to build a house for him. The Hebrew verb that was used for the idiomatic expression to stir up in Ezra one two uh, is uh, heir, which in which is he feel perfect. It is causative. God caused Cyrus to build a house for him. It was God who 
uh, inspired Cyrus to build a house for God. So look at this uh, verse. Ezra 1 and 2 illustrate how the Persian period background serves as a backdrop of writing the scripture. In this passage, the requisite ingredients of a typical ancient Near Eastern temple building inscription are present. The typical ANE temple building inscription has the name of the king. Do you have the name of the king there? Who is the king? Cyrus. The next is the year of his office. Okay? And the name of the God who owns the temple. Okay, we have the Lord. And the divine command from the God to the king to build the temple. So the, the writing of Ezra was uh, also affected by the, the uh, context when Ezra wrote his book or uh, when this book was written. So in the per first year of, uh, yeah. And another one is uh, these terms, messenger, governor, father. These are terms common in the Persian kingdom. And it was also used in uh, the book of Malachi. So to synthesize our uh, study, considering the religious life of both the Persian and of its captives, the Persian religious life seems to have no negative influence, but rather have positive ones to the religious life of the captives. Compare Cyrus with, uh, with Nebuchadnezzar. So different, right? Ne Nebuchadnezzar persecuted God's people, but Cyrus, uh, he was allowing people to worship God. The Persian religious life seems to have no negative influence, but rather have positive ones, particularly with Judah and Samaria. Although Persia had been clearly a polytheistic empire in general, archaeological remains and other sources show that Judah and Samaria had practiced their religious life, showing us that monotheistic faith uh, could thrive in a pluralistic world. Okay, uh, I have no time now. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Do you have some questions? Some are smiling. Okay, okay, Reverend. Sure. Thank you very much for the clear presentation. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, the presentation says that uh, we have a good king uh, in the person of uh, King Cyrus, and uh, he worships uh, other gods. Yeah. But God uh, uses this king to uh, oh, free the captives in which uh, were captivated by Nebuchadnezzar. So in that note, uh, is, it, uh, is there a message we can get uh, that uh, from this uh, king who became uh, so gracious to the captives uh, was uh, used by God? Mm -hmm. So how how could we uh, draw lesson from that uh, as we deal with other people? Mm -hmm. So it seems that there is a great possibility for God to use uh, anybody, mm -hmm. uh, even not Jews, even uh, maybe not Christians, or even the heretics, or even the atheists, or even... Uh, like uh, in the parable of Jesus, in the uh, Samaritan, mm -hmm. uh, it was the Samaritan uh, uh, used, uh, used by God, uh, Jesus in that uh, story. 
So what would be our reflection on uh, yeah. this uh, uh, truth yeah. in that uh, presentation uh, as we relate to the world of pluralism? Yeah. Uh, actually, in in this context, we have in this context we can see the advantage. Okay, at least the advantage of uh, the Judahites during that time of Judah during that time, uh, because they were given this opportunity to worship their God, unlike uh, unlike uh, Babylon. So uh, I think in here, uh, Cyrus is really uh, prophesied in the Bible. So we can see here also that you know that one of the lessons that we can give, uh, in addition to what you have said, is um, we can like we need to the the leaders during the time of Judah uh, also you know worked with Cyrus. Although Cyrus were worshiping other gods, they uh, carefully worked with them in relation to their uh, to their. Sometimes you know uh, if the Leader is not that good. We sometimes uh, are prejudiced to work with uh, that kind of leader. But in here we can see that uh, God has used this leader, Cyrus, and his people uh, coordinated with them. Carefully, we can, we can work with uh, these people, although they are not of our faith. That's one of the reasons we can um, give many lessons, but uh, that's one of the lessons we can get from this one. I know uh, you have still a question, but I think my time is over, right? Uh, I don't have time. Sorry for not following the time. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Pastor Ron. Uh, he already stopped, so I think we go to the next session, next presentation. <laughs>